Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hope you're doing well. We got some more Seahawks stuff to talk about, and like we were on Monday morning, we're going to be talking about making snap evaluations on some players who we have kicking around this roster who have turned some heads in recent days. Talked about Cody Barton a little bit on Monday. Talked about how good he looked against the Lions. Talked about how useful it would be if he would become a starter next year. You, how nice it would be if we could cross one thing off the to-do list. So now I'm going to continue the conversation along that same line. And I'm going to do it with two players who are probably even more forgotten than Cody Barton. In the case of one player, it's because there isn't necessarily a huge need for him right now. And in the case of the other player, because he's a complete afterthought, we didn't even draft him. We just kind of picked him up earlier this year, as a, or actually last year, as a practice squatter. And that's that. So, we're reaching. We're reaching, right? But what do you want from me? It's a bad season. We're a bad team. We got no shot at anything meaningful this year. We got one game left to play. It doesn't mean a thing for us. So we're going to try to find some reason to watch, okay? We're going to try to find something to watch for. Other than the fact that it's a game, right? Like for, for me, the fact that it is a Seahawks game would be enough to get me to watch it. Maybe I would hate watch it. Maybe I would watch it knowing I'm about to get very annoyed with what I see. But I would still watch it. <clears throat> but... What about the educational stuff? What can we learn from this game coming up? Well, we had two players, two not very well-known players, two players near the bottom end of our depth chart, who played pretty well on Sunday against the Lions. And I know it's the Lions, and it's not even really the Lions. It was the Lions, I don't know, practice squad in part. I was looking at the list of injuries they had for that game over the course of the year, and it's just like, wow. There's a team that has every reason in the world to get blasted by 20-plus points in every game they play. But two players made some people notice, and I want to talk about them and their futures with this team. I'm talking about Phil Haynes and Michael Jackson. So... We're going to run through some thoughts on these two guys, and I'm going to talk about what they look like they are as players and whether or not it's likely they have a place with this team going forward. Okay, so we're going to start with Phil Haynes, and Phil Haynes is a guy that I've always kind of liked. I liked him when we drafted him. I liked him when he got to play in the playoffs a couple years ago, and in my opinion, played fairly well. And I've liked him ever since. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to stay healthy. And before I say anything else... Let me, let me just make that very clear here. Phil Haynes is still the guy who cannot stay healthy. Um, he was hurt when he came into the league. <clears throat> he went on the PUP list, I think, to start his career. And then in 2020, he got hurt in the before the season, was on the PUP, got activated in November, and then in December went back on the, on the uh, IR because he got hurt despite having never played. So dude's kind of made a glass. It is what it is. So, if you're thinking about Phil Haynes as somebody who can play a thousand plus snaps for you in a season, a permanent starter, I think you've got to kind of get that out of your head already until he proves he can actually grind out a season without breaking in two. Nevertheless, when Phil Haynes has played, he's mostly played very well. He played well in playoff games a couple years ago, <clears throat> and he played well against the Lions. So... Right now, there isn't a huge need for guard on this team because Gabe Jackson's probably going to be here next year because the money, there's a lot of money we still owe him even if we cut him. And Damian Lewis is on his rookie deal. I know he's not playing that well, but we know he can play well and the struggles he's having this year have more to do with him as a uh, being, being played at an improper position than it does with him suddenly being a bad player. Nevertheless, we can still talk about Phil Haynes as a depth player. Does he have a place on this roster? Because I believe we've already released him from his rookie deal. Because he had to be released to uh, be put on the practice squad. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I don't think he's under contract next year. So, could Phil Haynes be a depth player going forward? 
to answer that, I decided to go do the same thing I did with Barton, look at the draft profiles that people wrote about him a couple years ago and compare them to what we've seen so far. So the Draft Network wrote this profile on Phil Haynes, and I just want to highlight basically one thing, because most of the notes here from uh, Marino are very positive. Powerful run blocker, effective punch in pass blocking, some positive moments when blocking in space, got good power, pretty good IQ, etc., etc., etc. But the thing I really want to highlight here is he isn't the most nimble or controlled mover in space and doesn't always arrive on schedule, needs to become more consistent coming to balance in space. And modest foot speed and sometimes appears sluggish, plays forward well, but lateral mobility is noticeably worse. So those are the things I really want to highlight here. Um, projects favorably to playing guard in a gap slash power scheme. And then I go to the NFL.com scouting report on Phil Haynes. And I take a look at their strengths and weaknesses. Let me zoom in here a little bit. And if you go down to the weaknesses, looked more fluid in his movements in 2017. Lacks fluidity and consistency when attempting to work up to his second block. Struggles to find centered contact as a move blocker. Could struggle to land on targets in space. Then I go to the Bleacher Report. And I look at their draft profile. Shows a tendency to have a one-track mind in pass pro and has to remember to play with his eyes up to pass off games and recognize movement sooner. Frenetic mover when he gets into space and will struggle to play with lateral balance and coordination. Not particularly quick or fast in any regard of his play and will be beaten by interior speed that explodes off the ball. So... When you add all this with what we've seen from him so far, and I know it's not a lot, we've only seen a little bit, Phil Haynes may be a good player, but I don't know if he's right for what we have on offense right now in this Shane Waldron scheme with what we're trying to do. Because I've always said that I believe that Shane Waldron will eventually want an offensive line that can play well in space, that can play well on the move that can make good blocks on the second level. So we can start doing some of the things that he did in LA with McVay. And to me, the things that he wants to do, he can't do because we have an offensive line that doesn't move well. And I'm not seeing anything here that says that Phil Haynes can be the guy who comes in at the guard spot because he's a guard and play well on the move. I'm seeing all this stuff that says that isn't his game, and we've seen him play a little bit. It doesn't seem like it's his game. So we don't really have the most mobile guards in the world right now. Gabe Jackson, Damian Lewis, to me, they're not great on the move. So it's not like we'd be changing anything for the worst. But the real question is, does Phil Haynes have a place on this team going forward? Maybe as a depth piece, you could keep him around. Because at the end of the day, when you're trying to fill out the reserves of your offensive line, you want guys who are good in some capacity. You can live with somebody who maybe doesn't perfectly fit your schemes. But as for Phil Haynes being anything more than that, as for him being a future starter, assuming we stick with this scheme, which as of right now, I think we probably will, I don't see it. So if the status quo remains in 2022, which it seems like it will, then I don't think Phil Haynes has a place as anything more than just good depth. Okay, so the next guy I want to talk about is Michael Jackson, because he played really well against the Lions. PFF gave him a really good grade. He only played like 25 snaps, but we all got to start somewhere. So he got targeted twice, apparently, allowed zero completions, and made pass breakups on both attempts in his direction. Now, Michael Jackson is at the very, very, very bottom of our CB depth chart, and he went out there in a situation where he may have not been expected to play very much, if at all, and he grinded. So, once again, we have very little film to work with on Michael Jackson as an NFL player. He played a little bit for the Cowboys, but realistically, all you really have to go on is what he was out of college. So, I'm going to try to put together the Michael Jackson that we saw on the field against the Lions Sunday with some of these uh, draft reports. And again, I'm just going to highlight a few notes. 
All right, so let's see here. If you go all the way down to his uh, draft network report card, it says here that he is a best fit as an outside corner that plays primarily in press and zone coverage. So not much of a man corner, but a good zone corner. Physical defender, excels in defending the run. He also has pretty good size. He's six foot one, 200 pounds. So you're seeing some of the things in Michael Jackson that Pete has traditionally liked in his corners. Now, obviously he's gotten away from that a little bit because right now we're starting DJ Reed and Trey Brown if they were both healthy on the outside. But we know Pete still likes these things. Still likes guys who are big, strong, can play zone. All right, NFL.com. Let's uh, check out the same information. So once again, you can see that he's big, got fairly long arms. And if you look at the um, strengths, big cornerback, long arms, understands zone concepts, recognizes routes, uh, steps downhill into run support duty. These are the things that Carroll typically likes. Maybe not so much the big cornerback thing anymore because it seems like he's kind of moved on from that. But zone concepts, that's definitely what we need. We're still going to be running this, uh, excuse me, this uh, zone defense, cover three. And good run support and if you go to this bleacher report um, um the scouting report you can see here well-built frame with thickness to be forceful in run support physical at the line of scrimmage and overall they say that he probably makes for a better zone corner and they think that he has a chance to excel there so we see these three scouting reports on michael jackson and they all say kind of the same thing might be a good zone corner in the nfl and that continues to be what we need. So I think that the Michael Jackson thing is a little more believable than the Phil Haynes thing. Now, do we need another corner? I mean, you always need corners. But here's the thing. Like, Michael Jackson looked pretty good in that game against the Lions. But so far this year, I think you could say the same more or less about Bless You on Austin. He's looked okay. Uh, John Reed, I think, has looked okay. Um, it, it just seems like whoever we put out there looks decent and that's, that is credit to Carol. I bash Carol like nobody else, but I will give him credit for finding a way to field quality cornerbacks, no matter how many we lose. If that's the only thing he's good at, then that, that, that doesn't get you that far, but it is, it gets you somewhere and I got to give him credit. He has consistently found ways to field cornerbacks who at the very least look decent. Why we wasted all that time with Trey Flowers, that kind of makes you scratch your head because we have seen us do very well with corner after corner after corner that isn't Trey Flowers. So I don't know what that was all about, but whatever. Moving on from that, we've seen Sidney Jones go from worst player in the league to quality starter. We've seen Bless You on Austin play effectively. We've seen John Reed play fairly effectively. And now we got this from Michael Jackson. It's not like we have a desperate need for cornerback depth. But a lot of these guys are free agents this offseason. A lot of these guys are not going to be back. So if Carroll takes a look at uh, Michael Jackson and sees somebody that he really wants to get into in terms of a developmental player, then um, there there is some evidence here. There's some reason to believe why it might make some sense. And look, we got a lot of free agents in that DB room this offseason. I know everyone's thinking about Quandre Diggs and DJ Reed, but it goes deeper than that. Sidney Jones could be not be here next year easily. Bless you on Austin, John Reed. <clears throat> Only guy who I have a ton of confidence in being here next year, honestly, is Trey Brown. Because he's still on that rookie deal. So... It might make some sense that Michael Jackson has worked his way into having some role with this team next year. And if he can impress against the Cardinals, because I I don't know how much he's going to play, if at all, but this is the kind of situation, this is the kind of player that you might want to throw out there in this spot just to see what's up. Was it a fluke? Does it mean anything that he played so well against the Lions? Well, only way to find out is to keep playing him against other teams, against better teams, and see how he holds up. So that's pretty much my thoughts on these two guys. A lot of guys have been buzzing about these two, and I wanted to address it. Phil Haynes seems like he can be a good player, 
but his injury history for me combined with his style of play means that if we keep all this stuff in place, I don't see it that well. But Michael Jackson, different story. All right, let me know what you guys think down below. See you guys later today. Peace out. Go Hawks.